this is a quick shot, so it's three minutes. So don't blink. I talk quickly. I'll try and use the pointer to point some stuff out here. Um, so thanks to the moderators for allowing me to present. Uh, my name is Zach Bergman. I'm one of the residents from the University of Minnesota. Today I'll be talking very briefly about the effect of fluid, fluid preloading on vital signs and hemodynamic parameters in a pig model of LPS-induced endotoxemia. I have no disclosures. So there are multiple models of distributive hypotension and subsequent resuscitation that allow for multiple clinical questions to be addressed, including assessing new hemodynamic monitoring modal modalities and challenging ongoing resuscitation strategies. We utilized a pig model of distributive hypotension using an up titration of continuous LPS that allowed for us to analyze venous return and perfusion, uh, both with and without fluid preloading. There is an ongoing fluid first paradigm for resuscitation in the setting of sepsis that persists in the most recent surviving sepsis guidelines, though there are many active clinical trials that are challenging at least portions of this paradigm. We use 12 pigs to uh, induce uh, critical hypotension, which we defined as a 25% decrease in mean arterial pressure using the continuous LPS infusion. We then split the pigs into two groups, a control group of six pigs that underwent standardized resuscitation with fluid boluses, followed by increasing norepinephrine dosing, uh, and compared to an experimental group that did not undergo any fluid resuscitation prior to initiation of norepinephrine. The red time points are when we obtained vitals, hemodynamic parameters, and laboratory values. When comparing the critical hypotension time point to the end of norepinephrine infusion, the fluid preloaded pigs had a significantly higher heart rate. And in both groups, the venous return was lower with a significantly lower CVP following norepinephrine infusion. When comparing the, the pigs that underwent fluid preloading to those that did not, uh, the venous return was significantly lower, not surprisingly, in the pigs that did not undergo fluid preloading. However, the important Takeaway is that our overall cardiac output and markers of end organ perfusion, including lactate, arterial pH, and SVO2, were not significantly different between the two groups. So in our pig model, we were able to demonstrate that venous return was significantly higher following uh, fluid administration after the administration of norepinephrine. But mo more importantly, cardiac output and markers of end organ perfusion were not significantly different between the groups, suggesting, at least in our pig model, that perfusion and cardiac output were maintained from an increased chronotropy from the administration of norepinephrine. We hope that this work may contribute to ongoing challenging of the paradigm and uh, evaluation of altered strategies for sepsis management, especially in fluid sensitive patients like those with CKD. Any questions? The table. Yeah, it's, I didn't hear a thing you were saying. Slide. I was trying to connect the words you were saying to the numbers on the slide, which I couldn't do. Let's say there's a hundred numbers on that slide. How many of them should I care about? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the I could could you could get rid of probably the the top box and just get do the central the parameters and the laboratory values. Your I mean, the, the primary focus is that perfusion is not affected in, despite venous return being lower, so. Yeah, you only, you, you, I think you mentioned four numbers. <clears throat> just, high, just have a simple, simple table of those four numbers. I think you talked about cardiac output, venous return, and arterial, arterial pressure or something like that. Yeah, the laboratory values, the lactate, arterial pH, yeah. and SVO2, yep. Play around with a, with a slide that just has those numbers. You can start with this slide and then immediately pop it out to you know, an inserted box that just has the, so that people can see that this is part of a lot of other numbers, but the only ones that matter in a table that's interpretable and, and, and goes along with the words you're using. I like that idea.
Gotta swell to get well, doctor. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I actually have two presentations. I have one e-poster. Yeah, I'm not starting yet. I have one e-poster and then I have one longer talk. So I'm starting with the e-poster. This slide will not be there on the day of. Okay. Uh, thank you for the call to the college for allowing me to present um, our work on the patterns of care and surgical outcomes for early stage rectal cancer in the United States. I'm Julia Cohn, a surgical resident at the University of Minnesota. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Um, the management of rectal cancer is currently evolving. Um, surgical management can include a total mesenteric excision, which is a big surgery, or a local excision, which is appropriate for earlier stage cancers, but can have um, a risk for recurrence. And then non-surgical management is evolving from the use of neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy to the use of total neoadjuvant therapy, therapy which involves chemoradiotherapy plus uh, chemotherapy. And this has actually been shown to um, decrease or even um, uh, uh, eliminate the rectal cancer tumor um, prior to surgery. Uh, we therefore decided to uh, describe the trends of early stage rectal cancer management in the United States and their associated outcomes. Uh, this is a retrospective database analysis using the NCDB from 2006 to 2018, uh, including rectal adenocarcinomas of stages, uh, sorry, of uh, T1 to T3 and NOM0. Um, and we encountered 22,700 patients, uh, which we divided into five cohorts by treatment. Those who received total mesenteric excision only, uh, those receiving neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy plus TME, total neoadjuvant therapy plus TME, and then either of those non-surgical treatments plus local excision. Uh, we had significant differences between these five cohorts uh, on all clinical parameters, uh, including pathologic complete response, 30 and 90 day mortality, uh, surgical morbidity and length of stay. Uh, we also had, uh, excuse me, um, predictors of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about my wrong slideshow. Uh, we, uh, uh, we discovered that um, a significant association between a higher Charleston Deo score and both length of stay and uh, surgical morbidity, um, likewise with higher stage, higher grade, um, and the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy or, TN or TNT uh, was negatively associated with um, morbidity and length of stay. Overall survival was not significantly different between any of these five groups, as you can see uh, on this Kaplan-Meier analysis um, with our uh, estimated percentages of survival on the side here. Uh, and likewise, um, oh boy, I will fix this. <laughs> um, there were, uh, you can see sort of down here, uh, the neoadjuvant plus local excision group had a significantly higher hazard ratio of um, five-year death. Uh, compared to the other uh, cohorts. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, we, uh, this suggests that neoadjuvant therapy can contribute to tumor downstaging, but um, one in eight still have locally advanced disease. So local excision patients may have compromised planes um, if salvage TME is required. Um, 
I um a lot in that and I will clean that up and also clean my slides up. I'm sorry about that. So uh, I think you're um, data slides in there. Yeah. That are it's the same comments that, that we've made previously. Um, people get lost in the data slides. Mm -hmm. I can't pay attention to looking or hearing. So you gotta your words have to connect with the data you're trying to show. Mm -hmm. And I think you can get rid of the first slide. Okay. Um, if you want to go back to it. I, I don't you spend almost a minute talking about the introduction to this. And I don't the purpose of a quick shot is everyone kind of knows this, right? Yeah. You could say there's multiple managements for um, colorectal cancer, including surgical and non-surgical approaches. We, our aim was to decide if, or to use a database study to determine uh, if there are any data to suggest one is preferable or, or more effect, efficacy, more efficacious than another. Something, well, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then you used a lot of the initials. Um, um, yeah. And, and people can't keep track of those. You know, they TMC, TV channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can, uh, I will clean this up. Or dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like And then if you're my age, you're going to think of the song in the 80s. The rock song. <laughs> And then I'll get asked questions about 80s music that I can't answer. Um, I will clean this up. I apologize. I uh, am post call from the VA, which is not a good excuse. Um, but the the ums should go away when I'm better rested. Yeah, I will do that. I think your your content is excellent, and I wouldn't beat myself up too much on your presentation. It's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, I think fewer slides are in order with bigger words. And I don't know that, um, you know, you need to put so much information on slide nine, mm -hmm. your pathologic slide. I mean, nobody's gonna have time to read it. I would focus on yeah. what you think the most important element is there. Um, you've got some significant uh, P values uh, on yeah. the mortality there. I would blow these out, level. the treatment group. Yeah, I think yeah. you can. Yeah, I can um, do that. I, I think you can. I, I, for, for these types of studies, it's important for people to understand in a summary slide, what are your limitations? What's okay. the limitation of this work? And I think you touched on the next steps, but I think it's important to give people a line of sight. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Give another one, Julia. I have another one. Hopefully the slides are better formatted. Okay. That's the purpose <laughs> of this. Yeah. No, I'm surprised. I uh, This is good practice for me to anticipate what can go wrong with my... Yeah, definitely go to the speaker. For anybody Absolutely. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Do it the day before. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Bad experience? <laughs> Uh, I'll just try this and see if this is the correct uh, iteration. Oh, I'm going to use the right one. I'm sorry, everybody. All right. Okay. So this is my other uh, presentation and this is a full uh, podium presentation. I have eight minutes and then three for questions. Uh, thank you to the moderators and the college for allowing me to present our research uh, regarding the surgical approach to splenic puncture adenocarcinoma in the United States. I'm Julia Cohn, a surgical resident at the University of Minnesota. I have no relevant financial disclosures. 
Splenic flexure adenocarcinoma is rare, less than all 5% of all colon cancers. Uh, and the surgical approach is complicated by its watershed vasculature and lymphatic drainage, which can be unpredictable. Uh, meanwhile, a robotic approach to colorectal surgery, broadly speaking, is becoming increasingly popular, but has not been well studied in this cancer. Uh, the optimal extent of resection is debated, and both segmental and extended approaches have been described uh, with no clear preference in NCCN or other guidelines. Uh, and you can see the different approaches that have been considered extended uh, in this study. Uh, we aimed to evaluate the patterns of care and outcomes of splenic flexure malignancy resection in the United States. Uh, this was a retrospective database study from 2004 to 2020 using the National Cancer Database, including patients with stage one to three adenocarcinoma of the splenic flexure. Uh, we found 7,412 patients, um, slightly more uh, part an extended colectomy than segmental. There were some regional differences uh, in the demographic background of these patients um, in both in treating facility and uh, region of residence. Uh, and a slight uh, uh, increase in, or a slightly higher Charles and Dio scores in the segmental cohort. Uh, clinical data, the postoperative length of stay and 30 day readmission um, were slightly higher for extended colectomy patients um, as were pathology uh, higher stages um, and clinically irrelevant, but uh, statistically significant differences in margin status and circumferential resection market margin. Um, but broadly speaking, there's a higher nodal yield, but similar number of positive nodes in both gro uh, groups, um, both surgical groups. Uh, on multivariable analysis, adjusting for demographic data, uh, Charleston Deo score, higher stage, and uh, more aggressive histology were associated with the use of extended colectomy. As far as oncologic outcomes, uh, on multi multivariable analysis, um, minimally invasive surgery, so either robotic or laparoscopic surgery, was uh, negatively associated with the risk of positive lymph nodes. There was no effect of surgery uh, on uh, the discovery of positive lymph nodes. Uh, and likewise, minimally invasive surgery was negatively associated with positive margins and uh, surgical resection uh, had no effect. Short come out. Uh, term outcomes um, were uh, associated, uh, worse short-term outcomes were associated with extended colectomy, both longer length of stay and higher readmission. Um, and there was no difference in readmission rates for patients who had a robotic or laparoscopic approach, although those patients had a shorter length of stay. Uh, this is a trend, the trend of robotic surgery and minimally invasive surgery compared to uh, and, and uh, margins plotted on the same uh, cohort. So this is percent uh, on the y-axis year uh, on the x-axis. And unfortunately, margin status uh, stopped being recorded in NCDB at two, uh, in 2017. Uh, the increase in robotic surgery was statistically significant. There was no significant difference in um, the rate of positive margins over this time period. Uh, five-year overall survival was not significantly different between the extended and segmental cohorts. Uh, and on multivariable analysis, um, there was again, no difference um, in um, five-year overall mortality based on surgical approach, uh, but a minimally invasive um, surgery uh, was associated with a lower risk of death. Uh, we conclude that Although extended colectomy yields more lymph nodes, uh, it does not increase the ability to identify positive lymph nodes uh, and does not improve um, the rate of positive margins. However, these patients are associated with a slightly higher length of stay and readmission rate, uh, which suggests that there may be more harm than good in the use of extended colectomy. Uh, meanwhile, this data supports the use of robotic surgery, um, given that it does not negatively impact oncologic outcomes. Uh, we're limited by the use of a retrospective database, which is um, inherently contains the risk of coding variability uh, and unfortunately does not provide, provide all relevant patient factors. So a prospective approach would be beneficial to this data. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Really, that was, that was really good. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, given your conclusions, how much did your model explain of your outcome? In other words, what was your R squared from your regression? 
I would have to double check my original spreadsheet on that. What I, the reason I'm asking that question is, are there still unaccounted for factors in minimally invasive surgery mm -hmm. that could be driving the utilization of minimally invasive surgery that don't show up because you just have a larger uh, unexplained variance, right? So if your R squared is 10% versus 60%, it would make a difference. I'd be prepared to answer that. That makes sense. I'm confused. You, you kind of on these slides, you have MIS and extended colectomy. Mm -hmm. They're different, different things. Kind of, you're making a couple of different points with your data. Mm -hmm. I would separate those. Okay. Okay. Um, that, that was okay. I could. The same content I guess about the. I mean, we. This is common in, in presentations, but it's not good. <laughs> yeah. So pull out what you can. Okay. I guess my question in that regard is since these are multivariable analyses, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to present. Um, I guess I'm already doing it because I've got the adjustment down here. I retract that question. Uh, <laughs> Did you just answer your own question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would second Dr. Chipman's point that, that I think if you just separated out the two as you do in your conclusions, that it would be more impactful to say your extended resection is not any better and robotic surgery, laparoscopic is mm -hmm. fine. And your slide with the um, that shows the rate of robotic surgeries, you, I think you need to change the colors on that. You can't oh, yeah. see the robotic at all. No, I'm sorry. This is on drive. So the final PowerPoint is going to be aggressively Minnesota themed red and gold. <laughs> it will be visible. Thank you. Let's just use this, and I can do this because I have a toggle. Yeah. For bearing with us, I think I'm the last one. I can say the few things before I start. Um, so this is a project in the Staley Johansus uh, microbiome lab that Sonia Boatman, one of the residents, did, um, and she's not able to present at the conference. So I am. The continuation as the lab resident now with Dr. Johansus. Um, this abstract was one of 24 that won an award for the excellence in surgery. Um, so it is being presented there. It's an eight minute presentation with three minutes for questions. So thank you all to the moderators for allowing us to present our work on diet, the microbiome, and anastomotic healing in a mouse model. My name is Alex Tracer. I'm a University of Minnesota resident. There are approximately 600,000 colectomies performed annually in the United States with up to 20% experiencing complication, the most feared being an anastomotic leak. Despite uh, surgical technique ensuring a well-perfused and tension-free anastomosis, leaks still occur. There are certain modifiable risk factors in addition to surgical technique, the diet and microbiome being the two that are intimately linked and will be the discussion of this talk. The human microbiome and the microbiome of any animal has many functions. Metabolism and protection and those listed on this slide are just a portion of those functions. In previous studies, they have shown that the high fat, high sugar Western diet leads to increased endotoxin uh, synthesis, impaired nutrient synthesis, increased intestinal permeability and impaired energy metabolism. This decreases bacterial biodiversity and leads to dysbiosis which has then been mechanistically linked to anastomotic leaks. In our mouse model, we supposed that lean diet fed mice who were given a Western diet slurry or fecal transplant would have a microbiome composition that was positively associated with anastomotic leak. In contrast, Western diet fed mice who were then given a lean diet transplantation would then have a shift in their microbiome concentration or composition, thus that they would be negatively associated with anastomotic leaks. 
We took 32 mice in each of the two diets, the lean diet and the Western diet. They were fed eight to 10 weeks prior to surgery. At that time, each cohort of mice was then randomized to either receive the PBS, which was a controlled buffer solution, or the reciprocal diet in the form of a fecal transplant. There were 16 mice in each of these four cohorts. They then underwent colon surgery and then were monitored until post-operative day seven when they were euthanized and the anastomosis was evaluated. On the left, you'll see a video of one of the colon surgeries. So each mice was gavaged with 100 microliters of either the control solution or the fecal transplant prior to surgery. The mouse was then induced under general anesthesia, prepped and draped in a sterile fashion, and a two centimeter lower midline incision was performed. At that point, the colon was identified three centimeters from the anus and was transected as seen. The transection was partial to ensure that the ends wouldn't recoil. Re um, and so the, the anastomosis was then done with 8 proline sutures as shown. The 8 proline sutures were then performed circumferentially around the anastomosis. I'll fast forward here to a, for a portion later on. So once the anastomosis was deemed um, appropriate, a retrograde leak test was performed with saline as shown here. The anastomosis was reinforced until the leak test was negative. Then the abdomen was closed with 6 proline suture and the mouse was awoken. The diet was initiated post-operatively four hours after the surgery. The mice were serially monitored after the surgery until post-op day, post day seven when the, uh, when the anastomosis was examined. At the right, you can see the three classifications we used to grade the anastomosis. The top left being just local adhesions, but no leak. The bottom left within small arrow pointing to a peri-anastomotic abscess representing a contained leak. And on the right, gross peritonitis. These are, result these are the results from the mouse study based on whether or not there was a leak present. The leftmost column shows you the diet that they were on preoperatively signified by lean or Western diet. And then the second column in that leftmost was the intervention, PBS being control and FMT being the fecal transplant. On the top portion of the graph, you can see that lean diet controls and lean diet mice that got a Western diet transplant did not have any difference in leak rate, whereas the Western diet controls and the Western diet mice that uh, under, underwent lean diet transplant did have a significantly lower rate of leak in the lean diet transplanted mice. This plot shows preoperative diet between Western and lean diet, and that there was a statistical significance in the bacterial signature prior to any surgery. The clustering of dots, um, the closer the dots are, the closer their microbiome concentration or composition was to each other. And you can see that the Western diet and lean diet mice are clustered separately. This plot is after surgery. It shows lean diet control mice only, and they are stratified on the presence or absence of leak. What you can see is there's a significant difference in the microbiome composition between those lean diet control mice that had a leak and those that did not. The bacteroides and their acromantia species at right are, were positively associated with leak, while the left-sided species were negatively associated with leak. In the Western diet control only mice stratified by leak, there was no significant difference, although this did uh, this trended towards significance similar to the lean diet mice. The next two slides show the, res the main results of our study. So this was all lean diet mice, both the controls and the ones that underwent Western diet transplant. And it shows that upon receipt of Western diet transplant, when stratified by leak, you lose the bacterial concentration or signature that was significant in the first slide that I showed, seeing that Western diet transplantation disrupts the microbiome. In contrast, those Western diet mice that then received a lean diet transplant went on to show a bacterial signature that was more consistent with the lean diet control mice in that they had the bacterial signature that was negatively associated with leak or more protective of leak as there were no leaks in the, the Western diet mice receiving the lean diet transplant. So our results highlight there's a modifiable connection between diet, the microbiome and anastomotic healing, suggesting that perioperative microbiota targeted therapy may reduce anastomotic leak. 
In the future, we hope to test this in a more translational or immune competent model, potentially a human primate, or sorry, a non-human primate or a trial in patients. I'd like to thank Dr. Boatman, Dr. Staley, and Dr. Johnson's for their work and all of the work of the people in this lab. I think one of the questions you're going to get is about the composition of the transplanted lean diet microbiome, because you show that if you're on a lean diet by itself, that's not protective of an anastomotic leak, right? There's a sort of a dichotomy of the microbiome in the, in the mice that had a leak and that didn't on or off the lean diet, right? So you, know, you, you still had six mice that leaked in the lean diet group, but it was the fecal transplant in the Western diet that was the, the big kicker. So what was the microbiome breakdown of that fecal transplant that affected the leak rate? Yeah, I, yes, I understand that question. Um, there's sort of supplemental data that I'll be able to go into describing the differences in the, the composition, but that, that if I understand your question correctly, you're saying lean dye control mice leaked still. And so then why is that? There's, there's factors, surgical factors that we can't account for or that aren't shown in sort of the microbiome uh, aspect of this. Um, but I don't know if I have a good answer to your question with the data that I show. So I, I, they leak, right? But you also show that they dichotomize in the slide that of your lean diet mice. Yes. That there's a difference in the microbiome in those who leaked that di than those who didn't. Correct. So do you... I think the question is going to come up. What did your fecal transplant look like? Is it the diet that's changing or is it that you're just giving back these appropriate microbiome in order to prevent the leak? Do you have a breakdown of what the fecal transplant microbiome was? Oh, like the, the tax of the genera within it. Within the, yeah, within, yeah, within can... the one that you gave the Western diet mice that was protective. Yes, I will. There's a bar graph that shows the bacterial genera and that's this slide with a lot of the data taken off of it. So this is lean diet mice, Western diet mice preoperatively. So this is eight to 10 weeks of diet. And what I did because it's busy the other way, but I can add things in is show the bacterial, the, the signature of that because, and I can explain it better too. The fecal pellets that these mice had were taken and then diluted down. And that was the content of the fecal transplant. So lean diet mice have a bacterial signature. They have the fecal pellets and then those are taken, purified, diluted down. That composition is known and then given to the Western diet mice as the transplant. My takeaway from that is that you can eat whatever you want to. And then before you get colon surgery, just give the, give a fecal transplant from somebody who's eaten well for a while and has good microbiome and it's not your diet, right? It's the diet of whatever fecal transplant is. Do you agree with that? The, so they show, I don't think we know the answer to that. They show in the study or we show engraftment rates and the Western diet mice who went underwent fecal transplant had lower engraftment rates, meaning about a 10, five to 10% take of that lean diet transplant. And that was even protective. So conservatively speaking, there, there's potentially an association where you could get the fecal transplant and sort of hit the reset button. But this engraftment is lower than expected and still showed a significant outcome. And off the record, we are doing this. We will start to do this in human patients this fall. So hope to have better results. <laughs>